again. Um, thank you so much for coming out here tonight um, to be celebrating Jonathan's book. Um, my name is Erica. My pronouns are she, her, and I am the events assistant here at Books for Magic. Before we get into tonight's conversation, I do want to go over some housekeeping points. Um, first off, we are kindly asking you to keep your mask on at all times during this event, covering both your mouth and your nose. Towards the end of the conversation, we'll be doing an audience hand-raised Q&A, so start thinking of some questions to ask now and raise your hand when the time comes. After the talk tonight, Jonathan will be signing and personalizing books at the desk near the side door, where you will also be able to exit after tonight's event. We also have additional books available to purchase from my colleague, JG, whom you met at check-in. If you are joining us virtually on the YouTube live stream, we highly encourage you to buy a copy of If I Survive You Online using the link in the live stream description. Tonight, it is my privilege to introduce Jonathan Escoffery and Nicole dennis Ben, who are here to discuss Jon Jonathan's novel, If I Survive You. Y'all. Y'all. <laughs> this debut had me soaring. Jonathan Escoffery, I am in complete awe of your writing and have to take a moment to thank you for sharing your gift with us. Woo! <laughs> if I Survive You isn't only a novel. It's not only a search for identity and belonging. It's not only a fictional journey of Trelawney or Delano or Topper and Samia. If I Survive You is storytelling at its sharpest, at its most creative, at its most abundant. Jonathan Escoffrey is a recipient of the 2020 Plimpton Prize for Fiction, a 2020 National Endowment for the Arts Literature Fellowship, and the 2020 ASME Award for Fiction. His fiction has appeared in the Paris Review, American Short Fiction, Electric Literature, among others, and has been anthologized in the Best American Magazine Writing. He is a PhD fellow in the University of Southern California's PhD in Creative Writing and the Literature Program, and in 2021 was awarded a Wallace Stegner Fellowship in the Creative Writing Program at Stanford University. <laughs> Nicole dennis Ben is the yes. author of Here Comes the Sun. <laughs> the New York Times Notable Book of the Year and a 2017 Lambda Literary Award winner. Her best-selling novel, sophomore novel, Patsy, is a 2020 Lambda Literary Award winner, a New York Times Editor's Choice, a Financial Times Critics' Choice, a Stonewall Book Awards Honor Book, and a Today Show Read with Jenna Book Club selection. Come on. So without further ado, <laughs> <laughs> everyone please join me in giving a warm welcome to both Jonathan and Nicole. Well, firstly, thank you for that beautiful uh, introduction of, of both of us. Um, thank you all for coming out tonight. Uh, it's, it really means the, the world to me to be reading um, and in conversation at Books Are Magic, and particularly in conversation <laughs> with Nicole Dennis Ben. I mean, of all people, this is um, oh it just feels like a really special moment that I just oh, thank you. Know, I you. I'm help. in awe of you as well. So, <laughs> so thank you. Um, I'm going to just do a very listen, a brief reading uh, from the opening of my book. And um, just to give you all a little bit of a, a kind of sense for the book, a little bit of context for what I'm writing about. And then after that, we'll jump into conversation, if that works. It be well, sorry, this is from the uh, opening of the book, as I said, but it's from a story called In Flux, I should say that. It begins with, what are you? hollered from the perimeter of your front yard when you're nine, younger probably. You'll be asked again throughout junior high and high school, then out in the world, in strip clubs, in food courts, over the phone and at various menial jobs. The askers are expectant. They demand immediate gratification. Their question lifts you slightly off your pre-adolescent toes, tilting you, not just because you don't understand it, but because even if you did understand this question, you wouldn't yet have an answer. Perhaps it starts with, what language is your mother speaking? This might be the genesis, not because it comes first, but because at least on this occasion, you have some context for the question when it arrives. You immediately resent this question. Why does your mother talk so funny, your neighbor insists. Your mother calls to you from the front porch, has called from this perch overlooking the sloping yard since you were allowed to 
join the neighborhood kids and play. Always the signals that playtime is over. Only now, shame has latched itself to the ritual. Perhaps you'd hoped no one would ever notice. Perhaps you'd never noticed it yourself. Perhaps you ask in shallow protest, what do you mean what language? Maybe you only think it. Ultimately, you mutter, English, she's speaking English, before going inside, head tucked in embarrassment. In this moment, for the first time, you are ashamed of your mother, and you are ashamed of yourself for not defending her. More so than to be cowardly and disloyal, though, it's shameful to be foreign. If you've learned anything during your short residence on Earth, you've learned this. It's America, and it's the 80s, and at school, in class, you pledge to one and one flag only, the stars and stripes. The greatest country on earth is the morning anthem. It's the lesson plan, a mantra drilled into you day in, day out, a fact as inarguable as two plus two equaling four. And what you start to hear as you repeat this to yourself is the implication that all other nations, though other nations are seldom mentioned in school, are inferior. You believe this. It's an easy lesson to internalize, except that your brother Delano, your parents, and nearly all your living relatives are Jamaican. When your play cousin moves from Kingston to Miami to your Cutler Ridge neighborhood, winding up in your third grade class, refusing to pledge allegiance to your flag, you know to distance yourself from her. You say a quiet thanks that your last names are different. If you'd had any context for the question of what you are when it first came, you might have answered, American. You were born in the US and you've got the paperwork to prove it. You feel pride in this fact, this inalienable status. You belt Lee Greenwood's God Bless the USA on 4th of July, and even more emphatically after visiting your parents' island nation for two weeks in your ninth summer. You disagree with every aspect of the island life down to the general lack of central air conditioning. You prefer burgers and hot dogs to jerked or curried anything. Back at home, your parents accuse you of speaking and even acting like a real Yankee. But if by Yankee, they mean American, you embrace it. I speak English, you respond. Your parents' patois and what many deem an indecipherable accent still play as normal, almost unnoticeable against your ears, except that it, it is increasingly paired with the punitive. For instance, when your mother says, Una can spill the thing on the table, una can't clean it. And your brother says, no me, mommy. And you say, I didn't do it, mom. <laughs> She'll say, then who did? Must be a duppy. The duppy becomes the scapegoat for all of the inexplicable activity that takes place in and outside of your house. The duppy broke your mother's vase, then tried to glue it back together. The duppy hid your brother's report card underneath his mattress. The duppy possessed your father, dragged his body out for drinks after work, and didn't bring him home until morning. A duppy, or ghost, or even a grown man can be difficult to discipline, so you and your brother share the punishments alone. In school, when your world geography project is announced and you're made to choose from a list of countries to present on, you choose Mongolia. <laughs> it's not till another student chooses Jamaica that you consider the tiny island a worthy option. Part of your project requires preparing a dish native to the country you've chosen. <laughs> this is fourth grade. Your mothers do the cooking. When they meet one another on presentation day, eyes ring dark from having wrestled with foreign recipes late into the night. They nod imperceptibly, too exhausted for pleasantries. As your classmate begins her presentation on Jamaica, your mother sucks her teeth, a sound akin to industrial strength Velcro ripping apart, drawing glances from several of the other parents. We could have brought in leftovers, she whispers, leaning in. If only you chose home. that Jonathan that was excellent and that was actually my favorite one of my favorite parts as well and so heartbreaking if only you choose home and for the most for most of this book is all is really Trelawney going back and forth you know who am I you know or answer that question or grappling with that question what are you 
right? And you know, I I was telling you backstage as soon as I got this book, I immediately fell in love. You know, one of the things that, well, you know, of course, reading and you know, enjoying someone in Bob's. I got an email from Jackson, and then following your email, and I said I had, I had to read this, and because influx kept me um, in the, in this text. And so I want to know, you know, what was the inspiration behind this book? Because you tapped into so many, so much complex um, themes that many Jamaicans are afraid to tackle, actually, even to this day, even in America, and even back home. And we're going to talk about that as well mm -hmm. in the conversation. But first and foremost, what was the inspiration behind this book? And how long did it take you to write it? It, it, took, a, it took a really long time to write it, honestly. Uh, I started... This is, uh, the, the characters were born out of a story that I wrote right before I applied for my MFA, it was, which was back in fall of 2010. And um, honestly, I, I think in a way I had been trying to write, I, I had a, the idea that my first book was gonna be a novel. Right. And for, for me, I, I just didn't know how to create characters I didn't know how to create characters who looked like me because I hadn't read characters who looked like me. Mm -hmm. And I didn't know how to ca write characters who didn't have my experience either because they right. felt flat, they were empty, they, there was no substance there. You know, I was trying to come up with fancy plots and then I was mm -hmm. gonna plug these generic characters kind of into those plots somehow. And it never, it never worked, of course. Yeah. And so um, I just decided to, to try to, you know, write from experience and write from my life. and. Uh, I really wanted to, I don't know, bring, in a sense, this, this is fiction, this is not my family, but in a yeah. sense, it, they do reflect my family in a lot of ways, you know, and uh, their trajectory is very similar, and I wanted to, I wanted to honor that, and to, I mean, it took, when you work on something for, for that long, I'm not saying 10 years ago I knew the exact shape or what it was going to be, that, that took mm -hmm. place over time, that understanding, Right. but um, had, had I not had that love and that motivation to actually see these characters, make it out into the world and make it, make it onto bookshelves so right. that people could, could actually experience yeah. them, um, I, never, I never would have stuck with it. It was like that mm -hmm. kind of fire that made me really want people to know um, this family, Chelani, Delano, Tafa, yeah. uh, Sanya, and um, that was my motivation to keep going and finish this book. Yeah, oh my God. And first of all, oh God, okay, so... Trelawney, Tapa, Delano, Sonia, all memorable characters. Even Cookie, um, yeah, yeah, yeah. another <laughs> favorite of mine. Cookie, Cookie's the, the cousin of yeah, the, cousin. The, 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 the boys in the book. Yeah, yeah they came alive on this page. Um, and one of the things, you know, again, you are so brave because, I mean, you spun this immigrant narrative on his head, right? These characters didn't really feed the island to, you know, for upward mobility or any of that way here all the time, right? It, they actually fled because Manly, you know, the history right, of Jamaica right. where Ma our former Prime Minister Michael Manley, and I love that you were didactic, first of all, like, you know, it didn't beat it over our heads. Michael Manley in the 70s was threatening, I mean, with his relationship with Fidel Castro scared a lot of people, particularly right. the United States. And they were, I mean, because they were, they were, they were thinking that our island was moving to socialism. And so a lot of the, you know, upper class Jamaicans fled. And, right. right? And so here they are in my, them land in Miami. Yeah. Um, and, and, and Manny <laughs> said that if you want to go, you must go, there's five flights to Miami every day. Right. You can go, but your money's not going with you. Exactly. <laughs> so he will run them up the island. So, and, uh, but here's the thing. And I'm, okay. So Jonathan, here you are now as this writer, right? And you are now giving us co the complexities of these people. Because growing up in Jamaica, I used to see these people as this, these people mm -hmm. in the sky, you know? Not these people right here on this page, right here, where I'm loving them, I'm there with them, I'm rooting for them, especially Tapa and Trelawney. And so I, um, what gave you the courage to know right about this? You know, what gave you that courage to say, okay, you know what? I see these, you know, I, I want to actually tackle race, class, colorism, mm -hmm. gender on this page, and I want to do it in this way. It's like you taking it and rubbing it in people's face, because, you know, <laughs> one of the things that I got criticized with Here Comes the Sun was, oh, how are you going to, you know, air our dirty laundry in public river? But here you are, Jonathan, in this book, and every dirty laundry just throw out of the window, everything that just... And so I want to know, how come you come like this now and just did this? 
you know, in a way where, you know, we're still stomaching it, but at the same time, we're there with them. We love them. Mm -hmm. You know, what? very nuanced. Talk to me about that. Right. Um, <laughs> yeah, that's, that's a really great question. I think, I'm, I'm trying to find the, the way to put it. It's like, I felt frustrated as a writer because I felt I could write I could write it real, like as I know it, you know, as I've seen it, as I've experienced, I could write it true, or I can like be fit. I can try to, I guess, pander to audiences in a way. I could try to pander, but I wasn't. I knew I, I knew I couldn't pander very well. <laughs> so, um, and so I felt, in, I felt that I was in this bind in a way. And so I just, I tell myself, well, just write it as you see it. Yeah. But you know, maybe you'll take it out one day, or you know, you, you you're gonna write, but you know, maybe no one's ever gonna publish this <laughs> anyway. So you know, almost daring myself, be telling myself, be audacious on the page, and you know, if, if the world's not ready for it, then mm -hmm. then they're not gonna put it out in the first place. And so, um, but for me, we I, I think we have to have these conversations yes. if we're ever actually gonna address any of these things to talk about. Um, masculinity to talk about black masculinity mm -hmm. to talk about colorism and um uh you know all of these different issues to talk about yeah. poverty or um to talk about i really want us to talk about jamaica through the eyes of a jamaican who always talks to americans who think all oh, jamaicans are exactly mm -hmm. one thing which is uh, uh they exist to kind of serve their colonial desires and their desires to go to sandals and have an all-inclusive experience oh, yes. and i wanted to write back against that and that was a you know a big motivation for me to to just keep keep uh keep going yeah, yeah. and you did so well i'm telling you did really well i'm telling you um <laughs> you know and because it like i said the nuance because again cl um, classism you know, here is Topper coming in when, um, you know, as Trillon was exploring his identity, his American identity, his Jamaican identity, and even hanging out with the Puerto Ricans in school. Mm -hmm. And then um, he was, uh, uh, Topper said something to the effect of, okay, you know, these butos, the butos. Mm -hmm. And, you know, um, of course, a slang for ghetto people, mm -hmm. you know, for people below a certain class level. Um, and so I, I, it's interesting how you're deal you're having these characters deal with this but at the same time you're also it's like you you the camera lens is like zooming in even closer to the details right because Trelawney too with looking looking in the mirror when he said i love that um there was a beautiful paragraph where he goes describing his hair mm -hmm. right and how it looks and uh, when it's humid how it's straightened and one part curl and even his hair couldn't decide what it is <laughs> right and so you know it's interesting because a lot of folks who don't know about jamaica nests or jamaicans would say jamaicans are dark-skinned people and bob mar then raise the slip and all these things but you here show us these um people sanya right um, Trilla, um topper and their relationship and how that came to be but also talking about putting it in dialogue too like who these people are because there was a whole part um under the aki tree where you had a very good discussion with um which i think was heartbreaking it was on page 70 or 70 to 71 when um Trilani and topper came um bumped heads mm -hmm. And he said to him, to his son, you know, three weeks in Jamaica can't make it Jamaica. And three weeks in Jamaica not going to give you what real Jamaica is. Even though he was there next to Zoe, his girlfriend. And, you know, she had a different take of the Jamaica. Um, but that was a very interesting scene. Because even the, the play on the small axe big tree. Can you talk about that scene and how powerful, for, for, for those of you who haven't read the book. Because I don't want to give too much away. But that scene within itself said so much about our history and what... Trelawney is you not know, presenting to his mm -hmm. father who doesn't you know who dismisses all of that yeah and that's a it's a great opportunity for me to um rewind just a little bit because i know you know book came out yesterday so <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> so apologies um from the part that i was reading from in influx this the the, the book opens Trelawney's nine years nine years old but we follow him into his um mid or, or late 20s in that same story and what he's doing is he's asking he's being bombarded by that question what are you and he is his first um attempts to address that kind of phenomenon is by leaning into different parts of his identity but leaning real hard so that he can only you know if i say i'm this maybe these people will leave me alone mm -hmm. and they'll ex you know and i'll be accepted in a way that isn't um uh 
it, that that promotes my own safety in a, in a sense. And so at one point he decides to lean into his Jamaicanness and he really wants to embrace his parents' heritage, you know, his heritage. Um, but what he finds is that his his parents aren't necessarily you know, laying out the red carpet for him to, to, to come back to Jamaicanness. You all heard me read from the part where, you know, at first he wants to just be, you know, super American and, and, and patriotic in that way. And then when he starts to get signs that maybe he's not America's ideal son, um, maybe he can escape to Jamaicanness. And he even imagines marrying back into Jamaicanness and leaving the country and never thinking of America again um, in, in, insofar as he would have that option. Um, but his father in particular um, won't, really, won't really grant him that. And part of the problem is that Topper, as the person, he along with Sonia, his wife, Chalani's parents made a decision um, to leave the, the, the island in the 1970s. And there was a lot of um, turmoil in, in the country yeah. at that time. Um, they had good reason to be concerned. Um, and they made the best decision uh, they could for the, for the safety of the family, the health of the family. Um, and, and because there were middle class Jamaicans, it wasn't really about upward mobility, it was more about that, that safety. And so, but Trelawney, who's grown up in the US and he is, you know, he's gone through college and he is critical of the US and he's, he's resentful in a sense of what he's had to endure in the US. Um, as a black person, and he uh, comes to a head with, with his father because he says, you never should have left. Mm -hmm. And so now he's criticizing, you know, one of the major decisions that his parents have made. And, and that's, I think it's heartbreaking for Topper to, to, yeah. to hear that, you know, that mm -hmm. I made this decision that supposedly ruined your life when, you know, um, so, he, so he denies yeah. that and then um, they, the, the, there's, there's heavy consequences for Trelawney having this kind of um, argument with his father that, that ensues. And, um, we, we see for a lot of the, a lot of the book, uh, Trelawney is living out of his car and he's picking up really odd jobs and uh, you know, trying to still, in a way, figure out who he's gonna be in the world, what kind yeah. of man he's gonna be in the world. Right, um, exactly. And uh, I love that you ended with what kind of man he's gonna be in that world because um, I read a New Yorker um, profile of you and one of the, um, it said here, the first thing that must be survived is, in life is a father, mm -hmm. um, that, which I thought was really profound. Because this book, of course, that one, that interaction with, between Tapa and Trelawney from the very beginning, you know, um, him, he, him even feeling that Tapa, his father, preferred Delano, his older brother, who was gifted with his features. Right. And then subsequently after the, the argument, what, what happens to him, uh, uh, you know, living after the car, the odd jobs, all of these things. You know, one thing after the other. But something I've not, not seen in Caribbean literature is that that talk, the um, conversation of, of masculinity. Um, you know, and so I love that you put that in the storyline. And I wanted to ask you, if, if uh, what, how hard was it to write this into the storyline, and were there any challenges for you as a writer? Um, yeah, I don't know when it when it comes to the that. The ideas of writing about masculinity, I think it's, it's hard for me to wrap my mind around it as like a concept um, that, I, I, that I go to, to like towards the details. I tend to write the details of family dynamics and oftentimes thinking about what fathers, like the, the father-son relationships that have kind of fascinated me in a sense or um, made me want to... Uh, explore how we might make a way for, in a way, like healthier father-son relationships or ways for fathers to pass down positive lessons so that their sons can go forward into the world and be good men. And um, so that, in a way, is what I'm exploring. So th there's, there's a story called Pestilence where um, uh, the whole, fa basically all the, all the, the men slash boys in the, the book yeah. are in one car and they're with the, the family dog who's been escaping mm -hmm out into, uh, into the night um, to, to mate with other neighborhood dogs. Right. And they have to make this decision as to whether or not to have, um, the dog's name is Double, Double O. <laughs> and they're, they're, they pull up to the vet, but this conversation ensues where Delano, the older brother, says, 
well, I'd rather be dead than have my balls chopped off. <laughs> yeah. And the father, Topper, co-signs this, and he says, yeah, that's what makes a man a man. Right. And Shivani's kind of like, he, he doesn't really know what to do, um, how to respond, but he knows that there's this kind of special bond that's grown between his older brother and his father that's, that's exclusive, and that he, he doesn't really, he's not able to take part in that, um, that love as he sees it. And so he kind of, he doesn't really say anything, but he, he co covers his lap and shakes his yeah. head. Um, trying to take part of this um, this thing that he's witnessing, but later in the story, there's this kind of regret, and he realizes this is this wasn't the right move, and this wasn't the right way to uh, to see things. And I think the larger the larger you know idea here is that no, that, like maybe there's got to be more, right? There's got to be more to healthy manhood than chasing uh, sex and, mm -hmm. <laughs> and things like that. Just as you know, just as one example. So, but for me, I, I really wanted to. Um, just explore those like in a relational way versus like thinking about uh, later in the story um Trelawney works in elderly housing um in a low-income government subsidized uh, apartment building and he his up his he's living out of his car but there's this opportunity to get a promotion that would take him out of homelessness essentially but what he you know the job Tie, or the job duties are kind of, you know, morally questionable. He's chasing down elderly people. He's um, trying to find ways to like raise the their rents, basically. Um, and he he's he's asking these questions like, you know, I could be a good employee, or it seems to him that he could be a good employee, or he can be like a good person. Um, and these things are at odds, and he's trying to grapple with those things. And so I think there's like he's he's constantly trying to figure out how to be a um, a more positive uh, existence, presence in the world versus um, doing these more self-interested uh, activities yeah. um, that would actually, you know, possibly benefit him a lot, in a lot of ways if he right. were just selfish about it. But um, he's, you know, in a way, between, he, he, what I like about him and, and, and Sandhya, to me, they're in a way the, the morals of the, the book you right. know, in, in a way they, they're flawed they're all flawed yeah but, um, which I love, right? but, but he's the one who's searching and um we, we follow him along on that journey hopefully you know in an interesting way that will entertain all it's very interesting <laughs> and, um you know as we move away from the social into um into craft because one thing i love by the way is, is flawed characters i love flawed characters which you gave us a lot here in all of them um but in terms of craft now because you know i mentioned at the top of the conversation that i was drawn into these people's lives that i felt like i was a part of it um what how did they um so of course you know yes we all as writers get inspiration but what made you say i'm gonna write this book in second person and then oh by the way the next chapter is gonna be you know how did you decide on the point of view to tell Trelawney's story versus Topper's story and then of course Cutler and moving um forward um, Delano as well like how did you decide on the point of view because it was so varied yeah and I, and I think the varied point of view was one reason that like if you've read any of the reviews you'll notice that in the first sentence they say Jonathan's novel and then by yeah. paragraph two, it's like in this in this uh, linked story collection, <laughs> <laughs> and then right. by the end, it's like in this novel and stories, mm -hmm. and and then, and I don't mind that at all. I think it's in a way, it's it's just how I wrote this book. In a way, um, I was building a world story by story, and the way I chose those points of view often had to do with what I was thinking about the psychology of a given character. Mm -hmm. So when I think of Delano, he's somebody who. We, we, he gets his own story, um, the second to last story in the book, and he is someone who, once he makes a plan, he just kind of goes for it, and um, he, in a sense, his, his business partner says, um, or he says of his business partner that he he thinks, you know, I wrote this, but I don't know if I remember, but, he, uh, you know, just because you, 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 you want a thing, um, you think that you should have a thing, uh, and I think that there's a way Delano kind of believes that for himself because he, he you know, he breaks the law to, to try to steal back his, his bucket truck so he can get 
um, a, a, a gig that will resurrect his tree service before a hurricane makes landfall. And he has good reason because he's trying to get back his two sons who've yeah. been taken out of state. And so he, you know, he, really, he really needs this thing. Uh, but the way I chose to write that was that it's just going to be kind of uh, go, 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 written in, in present tense. And um, he's, he's, he's making a plan so we know what to kind of anticipate um, uh, his, his wanting and what he's going to go after. And then we see how, you know, we see how it goes. And, you know, as usual, things, things don't quite go to plan. Um, you know, Topper and Trelawney, I think, I, I, I like the idea of them, they see each other as very different characters and, 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 and are very different people, I mean, in many ways they are different, but there are ways in which they're very similar, and I kind of wanted that opening story influx to be in that kind of long time, second person where we're covering decades, and similarly, Topper's uh, story goes the same way, and Topper starts off, he wants to be a fashion designer, and his father says, that's not, like, right. basically, that's like, that's not a masculine thing yeah. to do, so you're gonna work in my construction company. And, um, but there are times where he's, he's trying to, he moves to the US, he's trying to figure out what job he's gonna do, and he falls back on, not as a job, but he falls back to um, uh, drawing and, and trying to create landscapes, and he always has this kind of artistic inclination, but when, when it comes to his son, basically what he wants, I mean, what he understands is that my, he wants his children to succeed, and he doesn't know art to be something that will allow anyone in his family to succeed. And so the message that he passes forward is that, you know, don't, you know, get a, get a job, <laughs> get a, get, but get, like, something practical. Um, and I, I wanted to show, like, maybe the ways in which they pour over the details of their lives and some of the mistakes that, that they've made. Um, and some of the systems that, you know, encourage you to make mistakes, in a sense, um, that, that they do have a lot of similarities, that they just don't really, they, they just still can't quite connect for mm -hmm. a lot of the book anyway. Yeah, and even the, the fact that you, I mean, you made Sanya the, bre the breadwinner. I thought that was very interesting when um, Tapa, after quitting his job or got, he got fired, something happened. And mm -hmm. she's like, the way how she described it was, you know, if I could stay at home and doodle, <laughs> then I'll do it. Or it was, it was so sad when she said that. And just, just seeing him crumble, um, uh, um, you know, with with, uh, with that comment, you know, because I guess it reminds him of what his father had said. Nobody takes him seriously as an artist, you know. Um, and then of course him imposing the same kind of thing thing on his son, um, especially Trelawney, who is a, an English major, and that's something again. I mean, being Caribbean, uh, I mean, or immigrant, I should say, a good immigrant. That's like what I English, what 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 are going to do? Right, and then seeing, of course, it was just so sad, you know, with Trelawney again going, the, the shopping his feet, living all his car, the odd job, and his friends mentioned, well, what about your art? And he just kind of brushed her off because, you know, by then I'm guessing he's he kind of gave up. Um, you know, of course he becomes a, a teacher, but still, you know, what about his art? Um, so even like you exploring kind of generational trauma, but once again in your own way, in Jonathan's way, where. It's still so refreshing, and I, even though these characters are going through what they're going through, um, you know, one bad thing after the other, you're like, oh gosh, when is it gonna stop? You know, when are they gonna get their reprieve? But it, I mean, and but I want to ask you then, what? How do you? What? What was it? What surprised you in this book? As you were writing it, was there anything that surprised you? You know, or what? Are you like? Did you like plan out like? Okay, so this is gonna happen to Trelawney. This is gonna happen to Sonia, and. And Tapa, this is gonna happen to Delano and Cookie. Did you any did you plan any of that or just or you just wrote freely? <laughs> um mostly I build story sentence by sentence, to be to be honest. Sometimes under the Aki tree is kind of a I mean I still built it sentence by sentence, but I did have a final image in mm -hmm. mind where um where uh Chilani and Tapa are at this party basically and they have this big argument and you see the the fallout and mm -hmm. um uh Surprises, though. I, I mean, there were, yeah, a, a lot of it was, I think, su surprising to me. I'm, I'm trying to think of a, uh, like one good example. Um, I know Morgan and Timmy surprised me. That whole, they were surprising. Yeah. <laughs> so there's, yeah, at one point in the book, Chelani answers the job. Um, to he, he he comes to believe that he, if he were to buy the family home, then he would, in a sense 
I guess, earn back his uh, the affection or the love that he never really received from. He didn't feel he received from his from his father, mm-hmm. and and his father actually is saying, you know, here's an opportunity for you to buy it, and to buy it actually like really cheap. And so Chalani goes to to try to figure out a way to to get cash fast, and he answers a a job that he finds on Craigslist to watch a couple having sex. And they're specifically asking for a black man to watch them have sex. And he he shows up for this job. And to be honest, that everything that happens after that really surprised me. Because I, I thought, I, 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 I've been a desperate person looking on Craigslist for jobs. And I've taken some of those jobs. But not. I'm not saying I've taken that job. <laughs> but I have, it's important. I have seen, I, I don't know if they're paying, but I've seen that call. I've seen that call. We want, we need a black, I think there's like a title, like a buck or something. Like, there's like a title, you know. This is, a, it's a phenomenon. I'm not, that's not something that I just made up because I'm oh, you know, strange. I, I might be strange, but but this is something that, you know, if you look on Craigslist right now, depending on what neighborhood you're in or city, like you're probably going to see that. And so I thought, well, let me explore, like, what, what's that all about? Like, where's that, where does that go? Right. You know, yeah. where does that lead you? And, and, and then even once he shows up, like, let's see how we can push that further. Like, what else? Because what, what's at the root of a, of a call like that? Mm-hmm. Like, you know what I mean? Like, what is it that is, do you think you're bringing, is, is it like danger? Is it like hyper-masculinity? Like, right. what exactly is it? And then so we see what, what, what happens with Chelani from there. And so, yeah, that, that, that was, um, I did surprise myself there. I, I don't want to get too into what happens. Uh. Yeah, and I mean, just to speak to that, for me, what I interpret, I mean, not to give you book aware or anything like that, but this is the way how you tackle race. Mm-hmm. That, that, that in itself, because yes, the book started off with what are you, but living in America as a black man now, you know, like, of course, it's, it's no doubt, you know, the one drop rule, mm-hmm. he's a black man in America. Mm-hmm. And he's going through these things, like, you know, um, the, of course, that was, t- to me, you know, feeling that this couple feeling that they could, could um, you know, play on that, that scary right, right. detail of who a black man is watching them, you know. And I think that um, you did that so fantastic. You know, all the stories, they end surprisingly. He makes, they all make surprising decisions. And this is just one of them speaking on that larger social factor, you know. Um, and so I just love how you um, play on that. And then lastly, because I hear um, I see time um, winding down, how much res- how much did research play in writing this book? Because you go in in terms of you getting into the odd jobs, the details of each odd job, and of course foreclosures and golden age homes, um, the ins and outs, lobster catching, live music contracts. You know how much research did you do to write this book? And then of course not you know, not only that, till even the the nitty gritty of our history back home. You know, um, how much research do you do? Yeah, I, I always like to start somewhere that I'm really um, interested and fast, fascinated um, to, to, to learn more about. And so, like, I grew up with those stories of, of Jamaica where my parents would say, you know, my parents would say Jamaica was a paradise at one point. Mm-hmm. Nobody was hungry. Um, mm-hmm. Fruit was plentiful. It, people might have, there, there may have been uh, poor people uh, yes. who didn't have a lot, but they had access to the food. Mm-hmm. And I, I wasn't there. I never lived in Jamaica. So, you know, but this is a story that kind of lives within me. And then right. part of that narrative is that there was this major turn that happened where um, you know, violence was exacerbated for, for all the reasons that it, that it was. Um, and, and then they left. So part of my research was finding people who were, who were not just my parents who, who told those stories, other Jamaicans of their uh, generation. I did want to talk to people so that I could hear it from, from them. So it's not just what's kind of been recorded because you know, sometimes I have to be careful when I say this because I'm not I don't fancy myself a conspiracy theorist but you know the the people who have power often are the people who control the narrative mm-hmm. right and so I, I did want to talk to people and I also wanted to you know confirm things in writing and, and and all of that really aligned very well in terms of what was in the newspapers what's in you know the history books and what people people are saying and, and their attitudes the interesting thing I found was, you know, people had middle class Jamaicans had a real um, hard time with Manly at the time, and I think he history um, he he's, he looks better in their eyes through retrospect now is what I tend to find to all the people I spoke with. Um, but you know, when I went to Jamaica to 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 think about you know how I could write this book, I largely had a very similar uh, experience to Chalani, just in the in, in this one 
uh, particular way, which is that I, I spent a lot less time at, at, the, at, at UWE um, mm. versus like going out to nightclubs right. and yeah. uh, going out on boat rides and you know having just a really wonderful time and having that feeling like, oh, what if my parents never did leave? And mm -hmm. would I be able to just have this wonderful life that like these, this particular, very right. particular group of people that I happen to be immersed with um, uh, that they've had. And so, you know, so research meant traveling there, research meant reading, research meant talking to people. I went on YouTube to research jobs that I didn't do uh, that are in the book. <laughs> and I like to see people like actually um, you know, at work, I'm thinking of the, the, the lobster trapping, you know, mm -hmm. I had to wrap my mind around like, how do you do that? How do you find, what kind of boat do you go out on? Where do you actually right. search for these lobsters? And um, what do you wear? Like, what, what does that look like? And so that was a, a helpful tool uh, nice. as well. Yeah. Oh, wow. And, you know, I, once again, I want to thank you so much for this. Um, even when you said, you know, the people in power control the narrative, they're ultimately one people. Because I even flip to this page 37, you know, and when um, Stephen say, you know, the police, them shoot the people, them who black black. Mm -hmm. You know, right. um, that these same people who say race doesn't exist on the island. Right, exactly. Yes, exactly, yeah. right. And I was like, oh my God, Jonathan, you're taking it there. You know, I can't <laughs> wait to see what will happen at Calabash when you go. Um, <laughs> no, 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 it would, be, it, all, it would be good. It would be good. I, I promise, I promise. But, you know, I, I think you are so courageous and brilliant. Um, even the writing about things here, touching on um, the, the, uh, the themes you touch on. So I want to know then, what do you want people to take away from this book? Uh, what do you want people to take away from this book? When they all go home tonight and read it and sit down with themselves and process it, what do you want them to take away? Um, I guess just the, I don't know, just to, to look at, like we're, we're all given these boxes to kind of fit within. And sometimes some of those boxes could be comfortable for us just depending on where we are on the board, you know, and some of those boxes are less comfortable for us, uh, depending. And so I, I just think, you know, that same leeway that you might give yourself to expand beyond the box, to, to, to look at, you know, your neighbors and the, the people you come across and understand that they are, I'm not saying you don't understand this, but I, I hope that the book does, um, help people think in terms of you know Chalani who people are constantly trying to put they're trying to pin him down mm -hmm. and he's he's just such an expensive human you know mm -hmm. and that's really what I want people to see mm -hmm. very good and so I'll leave you there and now I'm going to open up for questions from the audience I know you have many um so any first um person who, who's brave enough Who do, I, who do I think the narrative that um, Jamaica was a, a paradise serves, and am I writing against that? It's, it's really complicated for me because I, I think for, for people to pack up, I've never emigrated anywhere. I've, packed, I've lived all over the US. I have packed myself up and I have driven 3,000 miles to a strange city, but it's still not the same. And um, I think when you invest, you make that kind of decision, especially you, when you never go back, um, you have to tell, you have to tell yourself a narrative, right, of, of why you left, and because um, you have to live with that. Uh, I think it can be dangerous then when you have a, a, a next generation um, who might, you know, some some. It just depends on what kind of person you are. If you're a person like Chelani, you might really fall in love with that narrative and believe that there's this place that you can go back to that that is going to kind of that that, that backward movement is going to maybe solve your problems mm -hmm. and um, I think there's a danger in that but I'm more I'm, I'm actually more consciously interested in writing against that idea that um, if you go to Jamaica like they don't like there aren't different Jamaican accents depending mm -hmm. on you know what part of the island yeah, yeah right um, or you know every I, I, again like 
like there isn't a multitude of, of um, experiences or, or people there. Because um, I find, that, that, I don't know, my experiences, I'll have a, a, what seems to be a lovely conversation with somebody and then they'll say, oh, yeah, I'm in Jamaica all the time because they have a lot more resources than, than I ever had. So they're there like a lot more than me and they're like, yeah, Jamaica's so great. The people are so poor. <laughs> oh, yeah. They'll do, you know, they'll do whatever you give them like dollars to do and... Uh, and it's just like, oh, we were doing so well, and then, you know, you realize, oh, we're having a different conversation. Mm -hmm. And so I felt I was writing more consciously against that narrative. Mm -hmm. Yeah, very good. Um, I was very lucky to go to MFA with you, and you've only become more well-educated in the creative writing universe. Were there things that you learned from MFA that you had to throw away or consciously, like, erase? I mean, I remember being in a, a workshop um, where <laughs> I was trying to decide, again, I was, I was trying to decide, like, who are these characters? It w I wasn't working on, um, I hadn't turned on in anything from this particular book, but I was working on this other, uh, my, my, shout out to Renee Zuckerberg, my agent's in the, in the crowd. She, she knows that, she keeps hearing that I have these, like, other little novels that, <laughs> that are kind of, uh, you know, in retrospect, bad. But, <laughs> but um, I was trying to figure out, like, who... I was basically writing these, like, blank characters, and they were taking mm -hmm. actions, but I didn't know, like, who, what, like, race or ethnicity or, like, what... And coming from Miami, people wear that on their sleeves, and they, they tell you the second sentence out of their mouth is, you know, I'm Puerto Rican, I'm, I'm, I'm Jamaican. Like, they, they really want you to know up front. It's like, if you have a prejudice against my people, you can walk away now. <laughs> or maybe I have a prejudice against your people. You know, that's just how it works down there. And so for me, it was strange to not write that into the, into the work. Um, but I went into a workshop, and people were saying, I started to hear things like, someone would turn to another writer who uh, another writer of color and say, you know what I love about your work? And this is after workshopping with me for like two or three years, is that you don't write about race. Oh, <laughs> wow. And you know, it's like, oh shit, yeah. that's how you feel. Um, and, and, but, but a, a kinder version of that was like, oh, look, you're, you're writing, um, I, I was writing like, it was like the swampy kind of noir-ish novel and um, somebody brought up like another book and they were like, you know, they didn't write about race and you should like follow that. And, you know, I left all of that behind. Maybe that's like, that's like a super, I guess it's just a super obvious one to me that, um, I realized the more I actually like get real granular with what it has meant for me to be alive, like the better my writing is. And I cannot, I can't step outside of my house. I, inside my house, like, you know, I'm not like anything, but I have to step outside and I have to deal with other people and, and, and I absolutely, I'm black all day, every day. So um, there's, I don't know how to write characters who aren't living in the bodies that they walk around with. Yeah, and I love that you said that because I feel like what made this book so full is that you embraced all of you, right? Yeah, everything, the, 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 the immigrant part, the, the black part, the masculine part, everything. And so that's what made Trelawney to me become so real. Um, and one of the th other things, addressing the MFA program, you know, the thing that I was discouraged um, to do in my MFA program was the dialect. Mm. which you nailed. I mean, I feel like you took a good risk with Under the Aki Tree. That, that means a lot coming from you. Yeah. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> I, got, I, I had a lot of pushbacks. Even when it came on to publishing, I was actually told by an agent to take the patois out mm. because of the, a, a woman, a, a, some people might know the story, some people here, you know, a, a woman in Michigan would never understand the patois. Mm. I've not <laughs> met this woman in Michigan yet, but I <laughs> I love that you did that and you wrote a whole sequence in Patois. And that's, that means a lot because today is Louise Bennett's birthday. And you kind of honor her by doing this. You, you honor her by, by maintaining the tradition, by maintaining our language. I don't, I'm not even going to call it dialect because it's a language. And so for people to tell you to take it out is removing identity. But you put it here and I love that. And I think that's what, to me, you threw out the MFA and said, no. I'm gonna write it my way. I'm not Raymond Carver. I'm not Faulkner. And those are the people who are stuffed on my throat, right? And so no, yeah, you spit it out, right? <laughs> you spit it out 
out in your own way, and I love it. So thank you for maintaining that. I, I appreciate that. So, uh, to write to, to write Topper's story where he's, in a sense, telling himself the story of his life. Imagine he has to tell the story of his life through the eyes of some woman in Michigan. Right. You know what I mean? Right. Like, I couldn't, yeah. I couldn't do that. I, bro, yeah. like, there wouldn't be a story. Can I? <laughs> um, <laughs> piggybacking off of that, um, do you feel like you're writing in a tradition? And if so, who are your primary influences? Mm. Um, the question is, who are my primary uh, influences, and whether or not I'm writing within a tradition? If I feel, if I feel I am, um, I, I think so. You know, when I first took a um, Harlem Renaissance class, uh, I, I I I dropped out of college first of all when I was like 19, and I went back, um, and there was a marriage that happened in between those things, uh, but. I suddenly, I was older, more mature. Um, I, I understood the worth of my money because I've been working a lot, crappy jobs. And um, I took this wonderful Harlem Renaissance class, also, also taught by a Jamaican professor. Oh. And I, I, I started to understand the value of tradition and, and working within that. And I'm, like having the, you know, maybe it's an audacious thing to say, but to, to, to have the idea that you're going to continue that tradition and, and, and move things forward in, a, in the sense of, you know, time is moving forward. And um, I mean, that, so Nella Larson was somebody who was a major influence on me. Um, I read, you know, I read Quicksand and Passing Back to yeah, Back. Passing is really good, yeah. Quicksand, though, I love, <laughs> to me, to yeah. me, Quicksand is, is, I don't know, it's, it's underrated. Because yeah. in the story, because if you think of In Flux, right, it's like he, he goes away and his, the way people respond to his body, his mm -hmm. physicality, how he presents. Um, the, the protagonist in that um, book, I think her name's Helga, um, in Quicksand, she, she's treated one way in the South. There's certain expectations right. for her as yeah. a biracial black and white woman. Um, and then in uh, Chicago, is kind of different. Harlem is different. And... I always forget which country, but when she goes to Scandinavia, it's very different, and there's all these different treatments, and and to me, like, she wrote with such nuance, right. because some of what she was dealing with, it was, it was not just coming from white people, it was coming from black people, too, right. you know, and, and being brave enough to say, hey, we've got some of our own, like, baggage yeah. that we, um, we have to contend with. Mm -hmm. um, so to me, there was, like, such a nuance and such a bravery there, and, and I always think of... Um, Think of that book and, and that author, and um, and you know I read a ton of Langston Hughes, the the Negro ar artist and the Racial Mountain like changed everything you know, I, in a way. I mean, in a way, I said I was still like asking some of those questions as far uh, up to my uh, as recently as my MFA. Um, in a sense, just like I was still grappling with, well, you know, if I'm writing a black character like, and he's. If I say he's Jamaican because I know I only know growing up in a Jamaican household, that's the only really, you know, it's one experience I've had. Um, our readers gonna say, well, this character is doing things, but like, that doesn't these things that he does doesn't seem to have anything to do with his Jamaicanness. So why make him Jamaican in the first place, and why not just like wipe out his identity in a way um, so that he could just go rob a bank or you know pull a heist or whatever he's gonna do. Um, but that 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 core tradition and those ideas um, that really uh, was a, a motivating factor. And I, I look at those early readings for my you know that, those foundational readings for me as this kind of touchstone for figuring out like are you on the right track or and yeah I, I think I'll, I'll leave it there. Thank you for that question. That was great. Yeah. Oh, okay. Go ahead. Hi. <laughs> Hi. Clavis. <laughs> We have so many wonderful authors in the crowd, first of all. <laughs> Shout out to all of you. Uh, I, I had a chance to read this early, and this book is just so phenomenal. I think it's such a wonderful Thank job you. with it. Congratulations. Thank you. I was really curious to hear you talk about the idea of survival, which I think is a big theme, mm -hmm. and how many people don't survive, either mm -hmm. spiritually or physically. Yeah. Um, because I think some of the freshest takes in the book happen through that lens, so I wonder if you can talk a little bit about that. Yeah, um, 
Yeah, it's a big question. I mean, in a lot of ways, they're contending with the, the like literal survival, right? Mm -hmm. Like, will I get the money to get the food to mm -hmm. eat to survive? Um, there's also this idea, though, about surviving um, our parents yeah. and what happens when they're... I mean, will I, first of all, will, will, will I die before my parents? Will the, my parents be the cause of my death? Um, <laughs> but then, then there's a way of, like, Chalani's very interested in this idea of like I'm thinking of my father who just died uh, a few weeks back and I think in a way I'm like am I like 50% less Jamaican now because like part of my connection to that culture like my direct access to that culture has been severed in a way and I still have my mother thankfully for you know um, but I think you know these characters are interested in those questions like what are we gonna be left with and what can we actually continue forward and for you know um, for people who are looking at, in a way, this, th I, I hadn't, um, I hadn't articulated it this, this way, but it came up in a, a review, I think, of um, downward mobility, mm -hmm. and thinking of, you know, your, what your your parents have, are part of this long line of people who got you to where you're at, and you spiraling down, right, yeah. and you feel like you're letting down your entire lineage, mm -hmm. in a sense, and the weight of that. Um, and those, I mean, those are questions that have kept me up at night <laughs> for, for a long time, but so I'm interested in, in playing that, that out on the page. So, um, from like the first sentence of anything I've ever read of you, I've always been so impressed with the level of refinement. So I just wanted to go back and you, I'm so happy that Nicole mentioned craft, because people don't often talk about craft. So I just wanted to ask this question, um, and there's so much that, that happens in your writing, and just the level of refinement and high literariness, whatever that means, um, happens on the page. And there's so much. I think one time you said that you, when you notice what you, when you know when something good is happening in the story, it's when you want to steal it. And there's yeah. so much that I would like to steal, borrow, but <laughs> what I cannot get, or what I haven't been able to figure out, maybe you can just tell us, is how you're able to accomplish with all that you're doing, character-wise and sentence-wise, such. N narrative propulsion, like if stories just move, and I just would love to know if you could just unlock that for me, <laughs> how, how that happens, and also maybe if perhaps it's it's tied to your roots in music and hip hop. But I just wanted to know, like, if like what, how do you do that? Yeah, um, yeah, I used to rap. Don't don't look, don't look for it. <laughs> don't look for it. Um, yeah, I think musicality is it can be a real uh, momentum. In the story under the Aki Tree, there's definitely a kind of, yeah, this happens, but then this happens, and then this happens, but this, this happens. This is the expectation, but this is what actually happens. Um, I think there's also a kind of setup for uh, suspense just through really small questions that you're planting in the mind of the reader so that they, you know, it's not like who who done it. You know, it's not that kind of thing necessarily. But um, you know, if you can contextualize for the reader, where where are we? Let's ground us in place. Let's ground us in time, and let's, in a in a sense, tell the reader what's like the next step for this character. What are they? Um, in a story, odd jobs. The the, the story takes uh, place over the course of an hour, and Chalani. He's baking in the back of his car, his like little mini SUV, and uh, he's out of gas. And he, you know, his phone's been turned off for weeks, you know, but he's stealing Wi Fi from the bagel shop that he's kind of parked next to. And, um, and the security guard is knocking on his window, and, you know, you know he's, he's about to get kicked out, and he sees this really odd job um, that is morally questionable. Um, and so we know, like, what. You know what's what might motivate him to actually have to take that job and, and show up for that thing, and we're we're grounded and we, you know, we, we limit. He's limited to this space in a sense in this car that you know will run out of gas at any minute. He can't draw. He can't drive very far, um, and so like putting those those immediate um, concerns. I, I think the the who, what, where, when, why, mm -hmm. um, and breaking it down that way. I think it's in a way it's like simpler than we sometimes like to think it it, it has to be. Um, and you know, just just grounding, and um, 
I, I had a great, uh, and I'm going to close it out, and I know we're, we're, we're on time now. So, but I had a, a, a great lesson in my undergrad where I had to sit down and diagram a story and read sentence, sentence by sentence to say, what is this sentence doing in the story? And what is my response? What is it doing? How is it working? What information is it actually giving the reader? And to me, that was a really wonderful exercise. What, what questions is it placing in the mind of the reader? That's the, the, the main important one, I think. Um, and you know, if it's, it's hard to detach yourself from your own stories, but if you can go back to older stories and um, try to unpack them in that way, like what is that sentence actually doing? What work? Because every sentence in your, your story or your book should do work. And sometimes you'll find sentences are redundant in that way and that they're doing the same work. Mm. And you know, if you want that lean prose, then you're probably gonna wanna cut one of those sentences. Um, but that's a theory. I, uh, <laughs> you know, I, I, you know, maybe, uh, I, I think there are also authors who, who like to really expound, you know, and just really, and so I, I think there's space in the world for, for that too. I think I'm in between, but I love that. I love that. Yeah, and um, so I am getting a signal again. Um, is there room for one more question or? Uh, yeah, I think I got one. So I was doing. <laughs> okay. Okay. All right. One more. One more question. Afraid of pandering you. Or afraid of reading you and like how you would react to you. Uh, to what I to what I to what I actually wrote or <laughs> um Yeah, yeah. I'm afraid maybe the you know when you when you write <laughs> the question's making me sweat. <laughs> <laughs> I'm afraid of everybody, everybody I've ever met, to be honest, and I, I mean that, because it's like, you know, I don't know, I've gotten questions from my mom who says, like, how can you call this fiction, you know, um, I, I'm sure there's people I'm going to run into, it's, but oftentimes if I, if I'm, if I'm creating a character who, let's say they say, like, a problematic thing, that's, you know, purposely in the, in the book, they are saying a problematic thing, Oftentimes, I've heard that same thing from so many people. The only reason I know to write that is because I've heard it from like a dozen or more people. And so, you know, maybe that same person is going to go back, and, you know, one of the dozen is going to go back and read the thing and say, oh, he's writing about me. Uh, but I think I'm, I'm writing about like us, you know, I'm writing about like who, who we appear to be, at least through my, my lens. Um, and, and maybe, you know, we can, we can learn to better <laughs> uh, if, if that's if that's a takeaway that isn't too pompous I, I think you did it the right way the fact that you never even thought about it you know because of course of course one of my idol and I know it's Robert's idol as well Toni Morrison you know so when you are actually writing you don't even think you shouldn't even think about that you know mm -hmm. they're gonna be on your shoulder you just brush them off and write right. and I for me when I was reading this I got the impression that you were even considering the fears or who is going who we are pandering to or who, whatever it is you never even to me you weren't even pandering and to me you didn't you feared no one you wrote unapologetically and, and you can tell when a writer is having fun when they're writing because you can read it and you feel yourself just giggling inside and that's how i felt for the majority of this book about all of it and um so i just want to thank you again closing out for writing this book such a brave amazing novel <laughs> Thank you. Short story collection. Thank you. Thank you. Before I hand the mic, I, you know, my, 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 my FSG team is here, my, F, my MFQ team is here, my, my publishers is here. Like, the, the, the book wouldn't be having the, Sean, my publisher is here. Like, the, we, we wouldn't be having um, the, the phenomenal like press that, that we're yes. having without like the work that you all are putting in. Because I, I wrote it and then I put it in your hands. And so, <laughs> I, you know, I, I just had to say that. Thank yeah, you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, John.
Jonathan and Nicole for the wonderful conversation and for sticking it out with us um, a few minutes over. Um, as a reminder, Jonathan will be signing at our back desk. Um, so please just wait to approach the back desk until he's gotten settled back there. You can purchase additional copies of If I Survive You. And as a treat, we also have Nicole's Here Comes the Sun and Patsy. And if you're nicer, maybe she'll sign them. Um, for those of us who are still on YouTube, you can find the link to purchase books in the description. That is all for me. So thanks again, everyone, for coming out tonight. Please join me in giving Jonathan, Jonathan and Nicole a final round of applause.